So Father, we just take a moment and we say, come, Lord Jesus, come. We lift you up, God. We lift you up, Father God, in our hearts, and our minds, and our understanding. We, we lift you up, Father. We pray that where we've put a limit on you today, you would break through, Father God, and that you can be all who you are in our lives, in our situations, in our future. And so, God, today, we do not rely on human abilities to, to do what only the Spirit can do, but Jesus, when you're lifted up, Father God, you draw, and you gather and you make yourself known. And so, God, today, that's what we want. We want your presence. We want you. We want all of you in our lives. And everybody said? Amen. 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 So, we've been on a bit of a journey for the last three weeks. And actually, if, you, if you've been around, God's been taking us on a bit of a conversation. And a very clear conversation, if I can be that honest and bold, with what he was wanting to do with us. And you know, the exciting thing is, is that he's the God of the church. The church of God is his bride. So he's not separate and bitty and impartial and, you know, he's God. And so what he started was, if I were to be honest, something a few months ago. You know, when you're really crying out to God, you go, God, what is it? What is it? Am I missing something? Is there something more? Because you know, when you've got those prayers, he's going, to, he's going to meet you. He goes, if you draw near to me, I will draw near to you. If you spend time, let me speak into your life. He's going to do it. But it's funny how he works. Isn't it amazing that he works differently for each one of us? Some of us will have writing on a wall, one day in Jesus' name. And then we mustn't freak out because that's also scary, right? Some of us would literally sit in the word of God and words would jump off the page. Some of us, it would be, when you're in the shower or in the toilet, you know, with your only moment of peace. Parents, some of you know that. For some of us, it would be as you're going along your days peeling potatoes, especially the men, you know, at night when you're preparing food. But um, it doesn't matter. But I, I know that God has been taking me on a journey and how he's arrested my heart and my attention. And what he's desperate for is for you. What he's desperate for is for me. And what he's desperate for is to actually gather us back. And I know we're sitting in a church and most people that are here today have possibly done life with Jesus way longer than I have. And the church has been going on way longer than we, any of us have been alive. But I feel that God's doing something where he's actually saying, can I have your attention and can I just, just realign a few things? And so we've started this journey and, and for the title, you know, you can, we can use the word fear of God and immediately people would run. And they're like, how can you love God and be afraid of God? And, and we can have these conversations after the service. But today, it's in the same, it's in the same breath of God actually says, can, you, you, we need to put him first again. And for some of us today, I'm praying that it would not be something that we fear in the sense of the spirit of fear, where we're scared of it, but something that we reverence and we all say, yes, Jesus, for you, you need to be Jesus in my life, not a... Not a um, an image that I've created that works for my life because then we don't get the power. Then we get an emotional made up Jesus. And then we wonder why we're not seeing the things that God promises in the word. But it's for him to say, if you lift me up, if you make me God and allow me to be God, the creator of the universe, God, in your life, watch what will happen. And I can't go back into all the things he's done in the last few weeks, but I want to carry on with that thought because we're going to linger until we get it because I believe when you do and we sing these words like all I want God is you. All I want and all I need is you and when we understand those things, we live a different life. We live the life that God designed for us. And so if you would, would you allow us to stay there a bit longer because, you know, if you don't want to, can't force you, but this is what God is speaking to us in this season. And so we're going to stay until he's finished saying what he needs to say. And I'm not saying this arrogantly at all. I'm saying this from a point of a prayer, a desperation, saying, God, please let us get this. Please let us understand this. Please change our, our portion of revelation into every single thing that you want us to see because it's a constant journey. Amen? Amen. Who's excited? So if we jump into 2 Samuel 6, this is what it says. You ready? You got your Bibles? Read with me. There will be some scriptures on the, on the back as well. And if I put in my own word, allow me, because it's the same thing, right? Because sometimes you put an and in and a hey, and amen, just because you want to get yourself happy. But David again brought together all the young men of Israel, 30,000. Uh, he and all his men went to Bala in Judah to bring 
up from there the ark of God. Now we know the ark of God was something that God initiated saying, look, I want to dwell amongst my people. This is how it's going to happen. And he gives instruction to Moses, but we'll get there in a moment. So they go and get the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who sits enthroned between the cherubim on the ark. It's weighty. It's real. God's not designed to live in a box, but it's where he's, de he's decided to make himself known. Like, if you need to understand this, this is what we'll do. Okay, Israel? I'll come and I'll sit between the cherubim on this ark. And then they set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio and the sons and all these guys were guiding the new cart with the ark of God on it. And ah Ahio... Because um, you know, sometimes you have to speak American to understand these things. Um, was walking in front of it, and David and all of Israel were celebrating with all their might. So what had just happened is they were returning from war. They had overcome the Philistines and taken ground and won this battle and that battle. And you can go read about how many victories David had with his mighty men. And so they celebrated because the presence of God was with them. And when you read about David, and it speaks about how God's presence was with him, and he would inquire of God, and God would answer him. Do you know... Even if it was just that, where we would, we would dwell in God's presence and we would say, God, what about this? And he would answer you straight away. God, what about, I mean, that would be enough as an invitation to say, come, come and find me. Isn't that amazing? And so here they are, they're returning and they're celebrating with all their might before the Lord with castanets and harps and lyres and timbrels and sistrums and, and cymbals and all these musical instruments. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark because the oxen stumbled. So here this ark is on, on the new cart, and it's going along. The oxen stumble. The cart sort of tops and tails or whatever, and this guy who's next to it goes, oh, we can't have anything happen to it, and he reaches out to stop anything happening to the ark. And then the Lord's anger burns against him because of his irreverence act. Don't you find that sometimes these things in the Word of God makes no sense? Yeah. Because all he's doing is helping. All he's doing is saving it. All he's doing is, is whatever the reason is. He might not even have thought about it, right? It could have just been a reaction. Oh, something's stumbling. But God's anger burns towards him. And it says, because of his irreverence. And right there and then God strikes him dead. Dead. And then it goes on. And it says that David was angry. First of all, he's angry. He's like, God, what have you just done? Like, you've just killed the guy, and all he was doing was trying to stop the ark from falling. And then the next minute, within seconds, you, you can see how something turns in David's heart, where he's first of all angry with God, and then all of a sudden he becomes afraid, the fear of God. And he realizes, hang on, we've stepped out of line. God hasn't changed, because God is a man that does not change. And so somewhere between God, how, what have you just done to actually, God, I'm sorry. And the fear grips him. And then the story carries on. And this account carries on where he says he, he wasn't even willing to take the ark all the way back to Jerusalem. Because he was now gripped by the fear of God, the reverence or the holiness of what this ark represented. Right? Are you with me? And so what happens is he then sends the ark and he leaves us at the house of Obed-Edom in um, the Gittite for three months. And the Lord blesses him and continually blesses him and his household and everything surrounding him. And so while it's living there, the Ark of the Covenant is living in Obed-Edom's house. All these things are happening around him. And the word gets back to David. And he says, David, do you realize that because the Ark, the presence, I want us to think about it as the presence of God, God's complete presence and holy presence dwelling in the place. Sorry, guys. Um, I can't see the time I'm um, having. It's, it's got a massive glare on it. Sorry. And so um, he, he, says to, he says to him, okay, okay, we need to go and get it. He's like, do you realize they're so blessed? And he says, let's go and get it. And he puts together the, the armies and the people who are going to go and fetch the, the, uh, the, 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 the presence, the Ark of the Covenant, and then so they head off on their way. See, this is the thing about this scripture is that sometimes we read these scriptures and we think that was a little bit unreasonable or a little bit intense God. All you need to do is read through the Old Testament 
to sort of realize God is a little bit intense. Hey? In the most reverence way. And we go, well, that's not happening in our days. And we're grateful for it. But all we need to do is, is carry on reading the scripture and just think about what's going on here for us to realize that this very scripture also exposes itself with regards to why this actually happened. And so what happens is we react going, that was out of line, God. And God goes, actually, it's not out of line. You are out of line. And so what happens is when we, we look, up, look about, um, to the Ark of the Covenant and, and what's been going on here, it would be good for us to actually understand what God's original intent was with regards to our entire lives. Creation sends out God's original intent, and He doesn't change who He is or what He desires for you along the way. It stays the same. He carries on pursuing us, and He carries on inviting us, and He carries on bringing correction. That's why Proverbs says, even the correction of God is kind because it's constantly bringing us back to what he desires for us. And so what happens in this story is that they place this ark on a new cart. And I said to Denver when I was reading it, I said, isn't it funny that the writers would go to the extent of saying, but it was a new cart. Because this is the thing that happens, all right? Is that when you look at the ark of the covenant, you have to go back to see where it was introduced. And it goes back, remember last week we spoke about Moses? And I said, this is an important part to remember, which none of you even heard me saying, but I'm going to remind you. It was in my notes. I said it. It says in Exodus 25, the offerings of the tabernacle, the Lord says to Moses, tell the people to bring their sacred offerings and then accept them from all whose hearts are moved to offer. And these are the lists of the things that we can accept. And he goes down the list. There's gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine linen, goat's hair for cloth tanned ram skins and fine goat um, skin leather, acacia wood, olive oil for the lamps, spices for the anointing oil and fragrant incense, onyx stones and other gemstones that are to be set in the ephod in the priest's, in the priest's chest plate. That's just the beginning of what God starts instructing Moses. Then beyond this scripture, if you carry on reading, and this is how we read our Bible, so many cubits, so many sephars, so many that, and we don't know what a cubit is, we don't know what a sephar is, and so we just read it, right, to get through the passage, to get the idea of what God is asking. But in verse 8, it says, have the people, receive these offerings, have the people build me a holy sanctuary. Why? So that I can live among them. In, the cre in creation, God creates Adam and Eve a garden. Why? So that he can live amongst his creation. So that he could love us. So that he could have fellowship with us. And he's constantly throughout the entire Bible and still today pursuing relationships with us so that we can live, dwell, be in relationship with him, be with him in his presence. And so this was one of God's, again, initiations and plans, perfect plans to say, okay, I want to be amongst my people. I want to live with them. I don't just want to provide for them. I don't just want to protect them. I don't just want to heal them. I want to live with them. I've created them to have relationship with me. I want, to, I want them to wake up and, and hear me and see me and do their days with me. That's what God's ultimate purpose is for you and I, is to have a relationship with the creator God. And so then he says, you must build this tabernacle and its furnishings exactly according to the pattern I will show you. And that's when all of a sudden these details, specifics of every little millimeter and who and what and how falls into place. It's incredible when you watch it. When you see something take place, you can watch the God TV and how people have made, you know, to scale things that, to, to representations of this Ark of the Covenant, of, of the tabernacle, of the temple, all these things that God has put in place. But the one thing that we need to understand is that whenever we read these scriptures and we glance over the details, there's a scripture in 2 Timothy 3.16, and it says this, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. And God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work, which means there's no detail in the Bible that just happened to fall in there to fill in the gaps. It was specific. God didn't just give Moses the instruction. It was recorded so that every single generation from there on forward would understand that God is a God of detail. 
He is a God of, of, of pattern. He's got a way. The first thing that God started to speak to me months ago, and when it started coming together, he's like, Charlene, there's a way. There's a way to live this life. He says, but it's my way. It's not going to be your way. And when you read these scriptures and you study these passages in, these, in the Old Testament, and don't worry, we're going to jump into the New Testament. It, there's a link. There's no breaks in who God is. It speaks about how this God, he, he, he's this God of detail, which we can learn. If Paul's instructing us, saying it's there for a reason for you to learn. There's a way and there's a detail, and I'm a precision God for you to get the outcome that you so much desire. And so what we can see is that God operates in an order. He operates in a way. And there's an expectation for us to operate in and live in and submit to in order that we can live this life that he promises us. See, even the Garden of Eden, if you think about it, was created. And everything was in order like we spoke about it. God created the sea before he put the fish in it. You know, the sky before the birds could fly into it. Everything was in order. But there's also a boundary and we know that because when Adam and Eve sinned and they couldn't stay in the presence of God, they were put out of the Garden of Eden. There's a boundary. There's a, there's a place where we actually can step out and be outside of God's presence. And so years later, Moses receives his instructions to follow exactly to the point what God has instructed him to do. And so what happens is, is that he's given these instructions, and this, 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 this ark was, was supposed to be made, and the acacia wood were made poles, and in this ark, this box, there were rings that, the, that these poles were supposed to go through. Why? Because people were supposed to carry them on their shoulders. But this is the detail of who God is. Blows your mind when you read these things, that God is so involved with every detail, because then you understand the greatness of our God. And so what happens is, in Numbers, you can see that God gives Moses this instruction. And as we saw in the first instance of, of the series, is that you've got the, the Israelite tribes, the 12 tribes. And then out of the, the, those, there's the Levites. And they were set apart. And they, they set up camp right around the tabernacle of God so that everything they did was around worshiping God. God was central to them. People knew that even how they set up camp, God was central to every single thing they did. And then on the north, south, east, and west, there were four tribes Three, six, nine, twelve. Three tribes of the um, the Israelite um, on 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 each side of the tabernacle. Do you guys understand what I'm, I'm saying? I'll draw you a picture next week. But at the same time, the Levites were the guys that were around. They were set apart. They were priests. They were the worshippers. They were the ones that were were given the task of looking after the holy things of God, of leading worship. But this is what God says. He doesn't just say the Levites will carry the ark. There's a specific clan within the Levites who are already a set apart people. And they are called the Kohathites. And God says, you, Kohathite clan, will be the only ones who can take hold of and carry the most holy things of God. And so they were the clan who were supposed to carry this Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders. Not the Levites, not anyone else. And God was very specific in giving them this instruction. When you carry on reading these, these, the, the unfolding of how God wants to be treated and, and how he's put it in place, there's, there's a clear boundary between like, I want to live with you, but I'm still not you. I'm still God. I am still the creator of the universe. I am holy. And so you actually have to follow these, these instructions, these ways, because you can't just approach me in and out. And because it, it, there's, the Bible carries on to explain that he's an unapproachable light, that he cannot put up with, stand in the presence of sin. Like that's what happened with Adam and Eve. They stepped out of his presence because sin entered in. Do you understand what I'm saying? Jesus is coming. Don't worry. Jesus is coming. And so... It says to the Kohathites, you are to come and you're supposed to do the carrying. And then Aaron assigns each man to do his work and what he's supposed to carry. Even that in the Bible, that God goes, look, there's tribes. There's a lot of people. And we're talking about thousands and thousands of people. And God goes, you're supposed to do this. You're supposed to do this. You're supposed to do this. And then in, in, in number seven, it comes to the point where the leaders of Israel, the heads of the families, we're supposed to um, bring in the offerings. And God says to Moses, accept these offerings. Receive these offerings. And what were the offerings? They were oxen and they were carts. And he says, receive these offerings so that the work of the tent of the meetings could carry on. Give them to the Levites, each man as his work requires. 
And so the Israel and the nation come and bring their offerings to the Lord. And God says, you need to receive them because this is going to actually help the work of the temple. And so then Moses goes ahead and gives it to them as they require, the 12 tribes of Israel. So it goes on and says, to so-and-so they got so many oxen, so many carts. So-and-so got so many oxen, so many carts. Each one as their work requires. But guess what? The Kohathites did not get oxen or cart because their work did not require it. They were supposed to carry this ark of the presence of God on their shoulders. Are you with me, guys? Is this exciting or, or not yet? It's very exciting. So somewhere in between God's original instruction to Moses and David walking along the road and Uzzah losing his life over it, we get caught up in saying, God, that was harsh and a little bit out of line. And God's going, actually... You've missed the point somewhere along the line. And this is what I want us to think about today. See, as, ta- as time passes and the world evolves and culture starts dictating because the world has changed, all you need to do is speak to a generation before you and all you need to do is have children and you realize you've become your parents or more than that, you become your grandparent, right? And when in our days, and we, we faced with this dilemma, that the world is changing. And so what happens is we get creative and we're told and we're employed and we've been instructed to simplify, become more efficient, come up with more creative ideas. And you know what the thing is? That is a God instruction as well because he's given us these abilities and these strengths. But what happens is when we cross the line and we want to take the word of God and we want to water it down and simplify it so that it fits into our culture, into into our preferences. Because we live in a day and age and these are just words that stood out to me while I was praying is that we're trying to improve and simplify and, you know, make things fit. And these are the things that, that I've heard is efficiency. What's beneficial to you? That God wants you to live your best life ever. But the problem is, is that we forget that it God, the God and the your best life ever. And then, and then we hear words of, we just need to spread the load. I mean, that's a real thing. We've got to make sure we spread the load. There, you, cannot, you, you cannot function if the load's not spread. Or equality, I'm, I mean, the memes. So memes, gifts, whatever, I don't know what the right word is, of, of you know, people are all fighting for equality and pay rise, and that's political, I'm not getting into it, but it is very funny when you see these funny things with women going, can we just rest? Like everyone still wants equality, equality, and can we just also rest? And that's a joke, ha, 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 it's funny. But the thing is, Guys, you with me? Equality is real and people pay rise. I'm not speaking about that today. But when we get caught up in equality, God's like, I'm not about equality. I'm about the things of God. We get caught up in fairness. Everything needs to be fair. I've got a kid who is so just and everything is fair. And if it's not his way, it's unfair. I'll tell you what, it drives me up the wall. But the thing is, you've got to learn how to navigate those things. It's not changing everything so that his, he gets his way. It's understanding what the correct interpretation of fairness is and justice is, not things going my way. And so there's these words, equality, fairness, capacity. We live in a day and age where it's like, I just don't have capacity. And it's true, guys. We live in a day and age where there are demands, where there's expectations, where we're on this rat race. But God says, when it comes to the things of God, stretch forth, keep stretching, keep enlarging. And so what happens is we live in the day with these buzzwords on our Instagram feeds, on our Facebook feeds, and the conversation, and they seem to fit where we're living in, and they become our standard. And so what we do is we then interpret God's word according to those standards going, well, that was unfair because the Levites didn't get an oxen and a cart. That was a bit, you know. Or if you were a Kohathite, you're like, guys, do you even know how heavy this thing is and we have to carry it? It's a bit unfair on our side. So it doesn't matter, and God's going, you've missed the point. It's my way. There's a reason that I've put these things in place. And so it's not about equality or fairness or capacity because there's a line and there's a danger when we actually oversimplify the things of God to make it fit into the culture and the demands that the culture and the times we're living in places us. And so we too can go as far as David and explaining, going, but God, it was on a new cart. It was a new way of doing things. It still worked. My men were tired. We shared the load. The oxen did the work for us. It was a new cart. The fact that those words are in the Bible 
shows us that it's so easy to justify and to explain why we've done something because it worked. Think about it. It's a heavy thing to carry. Let's just put it on the cart. A new cart. Probably the cleanest one and consecrated one as well. As well because they, fil- they, they followed part of the law. Meaning we, we figured out a new way, a new efficient way, maybe a better way that this could work. And God, you know, you know, because maybe it won't even matter that much. It's still coming with us and we, it's still holy. And God's going, no, no. And so what happens is we've completely justified and reasoned ourselves right out of his way. And then we're shocked when we reach out and we do something. And he goes, that's not what I've required. We cross the line. So Uzzah reaches out and takes hold of the ark. Maybe it was good intention. Maybe it was to save. And that's the other thing. We just want to help God out. We just want to help him out. Because we live in a day and age where we don't understand. We understand grace, but in part. We understand God's goodness, but in part. And if we don't understand the fear of God, we won't understand fully the grace of God. Because the grace of God on our own emotions is God is loving, He's kind, He's forgiving, He's accepting, is putting up with, and things never, ever changing. And so it gets totally watered down and out of whack. And so people, churches keep on growing and no one's ever changing and everyone's making things fit according to what they work and and works for them. And God's going, but you don't understand my holiness. So this word cannot work if you don't understand. The word of God will always work. But You can't expect the outcome if you're not actually applying the truth of God in your lives. Guys, I promise you this is a good good message. You should be getting excited about this. And so we've got good intentions, so we want to help God out going, it's okay, God understands, you can keep doing that. And we don't, you know, I can't get into that because of time. When David is brought back to the place where God's ways are way above his own ways, he doesn't just stay in a place of anger. Because that's what happens is it didn't work out. He was shocked by God's behavior. He was angry. But then God goes, don't forget who I am. He goes, okay, God, your ways are way above my ways. Awe, wonder, fear, reverence fills his heart. And God and David is reminded in that moment, and we can learn from that, is that when the fear of God fades, a community is put at risk. Because we touch things we shouldn't be touching. We work with the things of God that he's called holy and we treat them as common. We walk in and out thinking God's just there all the time and, you know, and we've, we've, we've brought him down to a level that we can relate to him. He's like, no, 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 I'm actually inviting you to come up to a place where you can see that I came down. You didn't just come up. He came down so that we can have a relationship with him. So David is struck with this, this awe, this wonder, and he realizes that he cannot carry on the way that things are carried on, and he leaves it and returns. But this is the most exciting part of the scripture. Word gets back, they are blessed. David goes, I need the presence of God in my life. And he chases down the presence of God. And this is what it says. He goes to obed Eben's house to get the Ark of the Covenant with great celebration. They haven't even got the presence of God yet. But they've prepared themselves and the army's there and everything in them is already celebrating because they're chasing down, pursuing, going to go and take hold of the presence of God and live in his presence. And so they, they're filled with expectation, with celebration because there is so much more to God than just the things he does. And so there they go with great celebration. And that's how our response should be, going after the presence of God. Because here's the thing, I woke up this morning, and I know it's so basic, but I'm praying that the Holy Spirit would would really just speak this truth to your life. When you get the presence of God, you get God. You don't just get an aspect of Him. And when we're chasing down His presence, that's how we were created. We were crowned with glory and honor, which means we were covered by His own presence. And when sin entered, that glory left us, and that's when we were left naked. That's what Psalm says. And so that's what happens, and God's going, when you find yourself in that place, you don't just get protection, provision, relationship with me. You get me. You actually get God. So we should be chasing it down with such celebrations like we're, we're heading for you, God. We, we want to show us your ways, whatever it is. Let us go and do whatever it takes to actually get back into the presence of God. But here it is in verse 13. He sends them back, and then the ark remains there. The Lord blesses the household of Odom, Edom, and then David goes to bring the ark of God back 
to the city, rejoicing. Verse 13, when those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, this, um, David sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. Isn't it amazing what happens within the same story? They, the ark of the covenant was left there because it tumbled over on a new cart. David realizes he stepped out of line and pursues the presence of God to fetch it back. And straight away, what happens? Did he bring it back on an ark? Those who were carrying the ark of David, he goes, sorry, God, you are holy. You've got a way. You've prescribed the way that we need to relate to your things. You've given us instruction as to how we need to carry on. And, there, and so, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to look at the time. <laughs> and so um, th this is what happens. These men start carrying this. Can I just stop and make you think for a moment? The weight, the, the presence of God is a weight. It's heavy. It's a burden. It's an easy burden, but there's a presence. There's, you can feel it. It's not something you can walk alongside. It's something that you need to wear, that you need to carry, that you put on your shoulders, and you carry it with honor. You carry it with respect and reverence. See, the principle of this, this lesson, this thing that we can learn just by something that makes no sense, something so way out, somebody reaches something to stop it from falling, and God strikes them dead, is this, this principle, is that God is the same. He's the same God that created the universe. He's the same God that gave these instructions to Moses, and he's the same God that is coming back. His ways are above our ways. So when we get annoyed saying we deserve a right, we've simplified it, this works for me, this is all I can do, God, you need to understand that. He goes, I do understand it, but you need to understand who I am. So this is what I read a story the other day, is that Jesus comes, and he's so approachable, and we read the life of Jesus, and as a church, that is our message, that is the message of Christ, that Jesus came so that we can, what? have relationship with God and spend eternity with him right there. It follows all the way through. But because Jesus is so relatable, we sometimes become comfortable with him. But you know that there's a scripture that blew my mind where it says, he says, you can blaspheme me and it might be forgiven, but you cannot blaspheme the Holy Spirit because that will not be. So although God, the Trinity, are the same, they're different. We know that. It's one of those blow your mind, can't describe it, because the minute you can, you've got your nail on it, you've made God fit into your finite understanding, right? It's just one of those big things. And God's going, okay, I, remember, I came down to you dressed as a man, took on human form, and so the, he made himself known in that way. But he also says, now the Holy Spirit's coming, and you cannot treat him with irreverence. You cannot treat him with commonality, and familiarity. He is still the Holy Spirit. And he already makes a distinction right there. He's like, you, 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 you've got to be careful. Isn't that incredible when we understand this? So there's a specification that, and precision and details that God actually wo weaves right through the entire story. Starts with creation, starts with how his presence is going to dwell. Right through, and you guys going, what about the grace, Charlene? Where's the good story? Where's the, where's the break? Where's our key? Where's the, the good story? The good story is part of all of this. Every single thing about Jesus dying on the cross, when he came, how he came, what would happen was detailed. It was prescribed. He knew exactly what he was doing. It wasn't just, okay, today's a good day. He knew when Jesus would come. He knew how he would come. He knew what would happen to him because the entire Bible points to his coming, to his crucifixion, and now we live reflecting on everything that happened and all the prophecies that came true. And there are still things that God is wanting to do, and he's saying, I'm not a God that's just going to put stuff out there. He goes, my ways are my ways, and they are higher than your ways. And yes, be efficient, and yes, pursue creativity and stuff. He says, but when it comes to the things of God, there is a way, and it is my way, because I am a holy God. I am above. I am not the same as you. I'm not on the same level as you. And so he says, even little detail, even to the last breath that Jesus breathes on the cross, he says, God, it is finished. He then goes into hell, and he, he, he makes a public spectacle, and he overcomes everything, death and sin, and, and he says, nailing it to the cross. They no longer have a right in our lives. He goes, to that detail, it's not just that he, he died so that 
we can acknowledge him as a person and a great man and a prophet, but it's so that we can submit our wills to him and live in obedience of him and come into him. So that's why when God says, okay, there is only one way to be saved. You see, it's the same God. And that we want to get caught up on the love and the beauty, of, but we have to understand it's the same God. There is only one way to be saved, and that is through Jesus Christ. And this is what happens. When we say yes to Jesus, we get in behind him, and God says, I can receive you, because on the last breath, it says that thing that separated, that, that veil, that, that heavy curtain that separated who the holy of holies from the rest of the people that only certain priests could go before, it tore that. It ripped from top to bottom, broken, open a way for us to approach God. But still, it's not us approaching God. It's us in Jesus that approaches God. And that's the key. God says, you can't just walk into my presence. He says, before me, everything will be judged. He says, but when you come into Jesus and Jesus becomes your Lord and Savior, he says, I see God, I see my son. I see Jesus and the price he paid for you, the ultimate sacrifice. It's not just a, here I am. It's in Jesus because of who he is. And if we understand him that God died so that we can have relationship with him. It is detailed. There's a way. See, the message, this message is not a message of con condemnation. And this is the thing. I keep, I keep speaking, and I'm like, this, this is quite hectic. It's not hectic, guys. Because, you know, the, the thing that's, that's gripped my heart is that the entire story of the Bible and the church is that we would return. The Israelites, that they would return to their first love. The whole of the New Testament is church, Come on, let's deal with these things. You're in church. Peter writes all those epistles. It's like, church, let's, let's get this right. And then, you know, it's this constant thing of coming back, coming back. And I believe that God is not just saying, guys, you, you're not living up to it. He's, I believe more than ever God's saying, guys, I am so desperate for a relationship with you. Not in the way that you've understood relationship. Not in the way that I've understood relationship. You know those days when you feel so close? He goes, there's so much more than that. He says, the latter days will be greater than the former days. And he's like, that you don't even understand. And I believe God is saying, guys, our church, church of the nations, church of the world, I want you in relationship with me. I want your heart. I want you in. I want you wrapped around by my presence. I want to restore all these things. I want you to live in my presence, not just know about me and carry alongside on a new cart on Sundays, on when we serve you, in our quiet times, and walk alongside this cart. He's like, carry my presence. Carry it. Feel the weight of it. Understand it. And I believe God is actually challenging us to increase our vision. Because if we think acknowledging Jesus and, and knowing him as our Lord and Savior, but we don't understand lordship, we, we think we've reached our destination. And when you've reached your destination, what happens? You stop moving. You stop carrying on because you think you've arrived. You think you've, you've, you, you're where you should be, and then you've got no desire to keep on going. And God's going, I just, I church, church, there's so much more for you, but it's going to start with put me back, allow me to be God in your life, not just what you assume that I've become. A little bit better... A, a, a last resort, maybe a first resort, but a powerless, emotional, I don't know. And so I really feel like God, he's so desperate to come. He's so desperate for us to not just read about Acts, but actually live in a greater thing than Acts. And so I believe that he is desperately calling us to more. Because when we pursue him, that's what we get. Not just a healing not just a relief, not just a band-aid to cover, but we get him. Which brings me to the most exciting news ever. We are going to be fasting as a church. Yay! <laughs> and I'm not saying it as a, we're going to be fasting like any other fast. We've fasted. We've done a lot of fasts. But if you want him, then get with him. And it's not legalistic. It's grace. 
He's saying, I want you to know me. And so I've made every single thing possible so that you can know me. So slip into that. So we're going to be fasting last two weeks of September. And then we're going to come together and break it on the 30th of September. And we're going to celebrate God. We're going to respond to him and everything that he's done with us. It's going to be a Daniel fast. You don't fast, Emma. And if anyone else is pregnant, you better raise your hand right now. (laughs) (laughs) But it's going to be a Daniel fast. And guys, you know what? If you start asking what I am and what I'm not allowed to have and how I'm going to cut corners and stuff, that's between you and God. We've had fasts like that before. I'm telling you, go after the things of God. It's a Daniel fast, which means no meat no artificial things, no refined things. It's raw, it's um, fruit and vegetables, grains, what have you. And and do what God does in your heart. If you start comparing about who's eating and who's not, you're doing for the wrong reasons. And so we're going to start on the 10th. Amazing, because my anniversary is on the 11th. And my big celebration is uh, food and eating with people. That's life for me. Um, But we're going to do it because I want him. And I want him in our church because when he comes in our church, then we're going to see things changing and moving. Amen? Amen. 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 So let's stand, church. Father, I thank you that you are a God that is way beyond our ways, our understanding. And yet you call us and you give us detailed ways And you've made ways and provisions for us to actually get into that place of of you. And so, Father, I ask you in Jesus' name that our hearts would respond. And with great celebration, we would go after your presence, your manifest presence, God. Not walking alongside our new ways of doing things and interpreting Christianity and the way that we can carry your presence. But, Father, we would pick up your presence and we would carry it. In the name of Jesus. And so, God, I ask you that as we do that, Father, you would open our eyes to see truth. You would open our eyes to understand your ways. And, Father, we would come in line with that. And as we come in line with that, Father God, we would step into all that you have for us. But, God, we ask you that you would be God in our understanding, in our response. And, Father, we just want to repent for anything that we've treated as common But, Father, with reverence and awe, God, that we would even have a revelation of what it means to honor and reverence God. And, Father, that in that place, even the spirit of fear would have no room when the fear of God is first and foremost in our life. And so, God, I thank you that you can do what only you can do. Holy Spirit, that you would minister to us, that you would seal your word. Your word says that not one of your words will return to you void, but you would accomplish that for which you've purposed them. And so, Father, we... We commit this word to you. We commit our weeks to you. We commit our decisions, our conversations, the big things in our lives. And we say, amen, have your way, God. And that even as you prepare us for this fast, that we would see healings. We would see breakthroughs. We would see new businesses birthed, Father God. We would see relationships restored. We would see doors opening that no man can shut. We can start seeing a shaking, Father God, that your presence will be on us. That people will say, how can we be saved? That we would start seeing, Father God, this church overflowing, Father God, because of your presence. And where you are lifted up, you will draw all men to you. And so, God, I pray that we would we would pursue that, that your presence and your glory and your person with everything in us. And everyone said, amen.